So today I'm just going to kind of continue on with what I, I talked about yesterday and, and the issues that we sort of had yet to discuss. I kind of described how, how, uh, you know, how we solved uh, Riemann problems for both the linear and I kind of stepped through the, the, an outline of what we would do in the nonlinear case. Um, uh, and today I want to sort of just continue on with that. Um, so yesterday we solved the exa the exactly the Riemann problem for constant coefficient <coughs> linear system and the linear shallow water weight equations. Um, is there a, I was just wondering, is there a pointer? Did somebody have one? Uh, and then um, and we described what was involved in, in, in solving the problem for the nonlinear case. And then, and then today what I wanted to say a few things about was how do we, how do these Riemann solvers make it into an actual code? Um, uh, do we actually solve the nonlinear problem? at every grid cell interface for the nonlinear, say, shallow water wave equations. And finally, something about the accuracy of these methods. Um, so just a reminder, yesterday we looked at this problem. QT is, is uh, this, this matrix, constant coefficient matrix A times QX. We computed the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. We computed the characteristic variables by solving that equation. And in most cases, and these methods are really only going to be sort of viable if we can do that analytically. But remember, in this case, R was a 3 by 3 matrix, and it turns out it's fairly easy to invert R. So we could do that analytically. We could find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors analytically. And then we came up with a solution that sort of said uh, that it's going to be either a left state plus stuff that is coming in through the left or a right, uh, right state minus uh, stuff that um, Minus sort of jumps to, in either case, we wanted the solution, oh, thank you, uh, the solution sort of at xt was going to be a left state plus however far we needed to include jumps to get us to x or start with the right state and subtract stuff to get us to that location x, okay? So in a discrete setup, we might think of a discrete mesh. Again, a finite volume scheme. We're interested in the average value over a cell. So we think of our at least for a second order scheme, we kind of think of the solution as living at cell centers. <laughs> Although really you should, you know, it's not, you should really think of the solution as not a pointwise value, but it's really the average of, this, of the solution over this grid cell. Our grid cell mesh spacing is delta x, and we think of the edges as indices by minus a half. Uh, the centers are, are indexed by uh, sort of integers, xi, x1, x2, x3, etc. Um, so here's our mesh spacing, here are the edges, and our time increment, we'll just use the, we'll use n as the time increment, okay? So what happens, let's go back again to this, just a simple scalar case. Well, we might have two piecewise constant values here, and if u is positive, stuff in this cell might, in one time step, move into this cell, okay? So what, what, what is, so what is the up, what is the solution how is the solution to this cell changed? Well, it's changed by this shaded amount. And so somehow the average value, the new average, will be the old average. So the new, the new amount of stuff in the cell will be the old amount of stuff. And remember, we multiply by delta x because if q is an average value, then delta x times q will give us the total amount in the cell. So it's new stuff is equal to old stuff minus this u delta t, which is really this distance right here, it's just that, the width of this rectangle, times the height of the rectangle. The height of the rectangle is just the difference between qi is qi minus 1 minus qi. And you might think, well, I've really got qi minus qi minus 1, but then there's a minus sign here. So it really does work out that this, this, ex this expression here is really this area of the shaded, is the area of this shaded rectangle um, uh, yeah. And of course, the same thing happens if we happen to be coming in from the left. Okay? And the signs, you sort of, you know, kind of convince yourself that the signs, in fact, work out. So that in general, what we get is some kind of formula that looks like this. The, the new value of qn plus 1 is old value. And here I've just divided through by delta x. It's delta t times, well, now I've included both the possibility that we may have something coming in through the right, or we may have something coming in through the left. 
And in the scalar case, only one of these will be a non-zero value. So if you use positive, this will be non-zero. And if you use negative, this will be non-zero. But in both cases, but, but we can sort of formally write down an expression that involves uh, uh, both cases in kind of one expression. And the way we do this in GeoClaw or ClawPack is we think of this jump here as being a wave. Okay, so this is just simply the difference between a cell and it's and it will always be the difference between a cell and its cell to the left, okay, or an index space, the, the i minus one cell. And we write out our scheme something like this. And this is somehow, we, we often refer to this as the wave propagation algorithm. It was Randy Levesque who really uh, developed this idea, sort of formalized this idea. Um, uh, so I'll often refer to wave propagation algorithms, and what I mean are, is an algorithm that sort of uses this formalism. Okay? Um, it, we take it one step farther and we say, well, let's again look at this shaded area. This shaded area we refer to as a, as a fluctuation. A fluctuation is really this entire piece right here. Okay? It's this u plus times the wave, or this u minus times the wave. And um, I suppose, strictly speaking, the area wouldn't have to involve delta t. But, but uh, we'll think of just this piece here as being this fluctuation. So this is really how, how things are written out. It's this a plus. And this, this kind of notation is supposed to kind of remind you of a times a jump in q, which is really where, where these waves come from. Okay, So we've decomposed the jump in Q into right-going waves and left-going waves. In the system case, we can do exactly the same thing. It's just that now we have lots of waves and lots of speeds. So instead of a U, a single U, we might have a lambda, which plays the same role. It's just that these are now the eigenvectors of our, of our matrix. And, and, and again, you, know, you might think, well, this is only really going to apply in the constant coefficient case. But in fact, I'll show you in a minute that, that we really use the same formalism even in the nonlinear case. Okay? So now the waves are just slightly more complicated. They're scalar, scalar multiples of eigenvectors. So the pth wave will be a scalar multiple of the pth eigenvector. And remember, we got these by solving a linear system. We, we, we looked at our jump in our left and right states. We, uh, and then we wrote it, we came up with a linear combination of eigenvectors that gave us that jump and then just simply identified each term in this linear combination as a wave. And the fluctuations now are the right going waves and the left going waves modified by these speeds. Okay? And again, the plus and the minus have the same meaning as they did in the scalar case. Okay? So, so this is really what you would see inside of a claw pack code. If you looked at a Riemann solver, and I have this in, in the lab, uh, if, if you're interested, you can go ahead and, and take a look at this. This is the file rp1. It's a Fortran file. And, and, and this is essentially what it does. Okay, here I write here for the shallow, linear shallow water case, we have a constant out that we square root of gravity times our, our capital H. And then we loop over, we loop over all the, all the, all the, um, the interfaces. Okay. We compute the jump between left and right states. We compute the speeds. Remember, these are the eigenvector, eigenvalues of our, of our linear system. We compute these. Uh, uh, we have to compute alpha 1 and alpha 2. And we did those analytically yesterday. You can go back and verify that this is exactly what we, what we showed yesterday. We write down the waves. And you, one of the things you have to kind of get used to a little bit is this indexing. It's, it's a little maybe not, not completely obvious what this means. but but if you, if you look at it, it'll, it'll make sense. Here's wave 1 and wave 2. But basically, this is just alpha 1 times eigenvector 1. And this is alpha 2 times eigenvector 2. You remember, the components of the eigenvector were minus square root gh and gravity and plus square root gh and gravity. And then the fluctuations are just the sum of, of these things. Here's the minimum speed times a wave for the minus fluctuations and uh, a positive speed times uh, a, the positive part of the speed for the positive fluctuations. So this is, this is essentially it. And I, I sort of point this out because it's probably you know, the way that a Godinoff algorithm is often described. It says, you know, find a Q star, evaluate your flux function, update your finite volume scheme by writing down a difference of fluxes. 
And if you were to look at this, you'd go, wait, where's my difference of fluxes? There's no difference of fluxes here, you know. And, and so it might make it a little confusing. I'll say something about this in a minute. Um, so now, but you know, we also spent a bit of time yesterday talking about an exact Riemann solver where we worked hard to find, you know, a rarefaction wave and a shock wave, and we had to solve this nonlinear system, and it's perhaps maybe a bit mysterious, but I think if you were to actually sit down and do it once, you would realize it's not, it's not impossible. Um, well, we can actually construct wave speeds and fluctuations in the same way. Our waves are simply the jump between states. So as q right minus q star would be the wave would be wave two, q star minus q l might be wave one, and we don't worry so much. Generally, we won't worry so much about the fact that this is a this is a rarefaction, unless in this unless we're in a transonic case, because you can imagine this rarefaction might cut through the q star value here, and then you kind of worry, well, what do we do then? And 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 and, and there are certain fixes that we might have to do, but um, and the Riemann solvers will take that into account. But in general, we'll think of, of kind of the, the, the waves as being the, the differences between, between states and the fluctuations. Well, in, um, assuming we have a flux function, we simply write down the, the, the fluctuations are simply f evaluated at, at, say, the right state minus f evaluated at the star state, um, or f evaluated at the star state minus f evaluated at the left. So, so this is basically a difference of fluxes. The waves are the differences between in values, and the, and the fluctuations are the differences in fluxes. Okay? And the speeds we would obtain is either the shock speed or the average speed in a rarefaction. Okay, so how, what's, what is the connection to, say, a difference of fluxes? You know, in a finite volume scheme, we, we difference fluxes. Well, um, numerical fluxes can be written in terms of fluctuations, so I can write my numerical flux as f at the right state minus this fluctuation, or f at the left state plus the fluctuation. And then so that the difference, so in the case where we have a conservation law, our difference of fluxes is exactly this expression here. And so it's just that in our codes, you're, you're going to see this instead of this. And the reason we do this is because it really allows us to solve a broader class of equations. So not all hyperbolic problems are in conservation form. There's lots of examples of hyperbolic problems that are not in conservation form. And uh, simply, you know, u gradient q, okay, that's a, um, a, standard, a standard sort of equation that's not in conservation form and would be difficult to implement if all you had was a solver that required a flux function. And a lot of finite volume schemes just simply assume that you have a flux function. And if you don't, you sometimes have to then kind of reformulate your equations to sort of artificially give yourself a flux function. And we don't, we don't require that. I can maybe say a few things tomorrow about that. So what about the nonlinear case, okay? <laughs> In fact, you know, what I showed is that if, you know, here, if we do decide we want to exactly solve a Riemann problem, we can actually... Have, would have no problem using this formula, formalism, but in, in, in most cases it turns out it's not necessary to solve the exact problem. I mean, historically it was perhaps because it was too expensive, but even now when you might think, you know, why don't we just solve it on a GPU, and that actually might not be a bad, a bad way to use a GPU, um, there doesn't seem to be a lot of, new, of, of sort of real reasons for doing it, so what we in fact do is linearize our, our nonlinear PDE, and we, um, so we write down a quasi-linear form of the, of the solution, and uh, so that it looks basically like our, our, our constant coefficient linear system, okay, and in fact we solve it exactly the same way, except that now that, except that f prime of q has been evaluated at some funny state, q hat, and so we now have a matrix that, for say a, a particular time step, is kind of frozen. All right, it's frozen at these q hat values. And you might think, okay, well, what do I take for that? You know, do I average q right and q left? Do I, you know, what do I do? Well, it turns out this is kind of a a, a subtle business. And and Phil Rowe, in a in a sort of a very well known paper, this is one of the the papers that JCP actually reprinted reprinted recently. So it's still possible to actually go online and get this paper. He showed an approach that that um, that told you exactly which what to pick for q hat because remember we need to satisfy this jump condition across every interface and just by picking an arbitrary q hat we won't necessarily solve this non satisfy this nonlinear condition 
In general, for general systems, it may not be so easy to find this one, but, it's, but Phil Rowe showed that for many important systems, we can find this, this kind of what's called a row average value. Um, in the case of shallow water, the row average values look like this. In, in, in fact, it's just the <coughs> average height. And the velocity is a bit funny. It's like, OK, some kind of weighted average of the, um, of the velocity in the left and the right states. So in, in, in both cases, the, the average values depend on the values in the left and right states. So we, we, we evaluate our, our, F, our flux Jacobian at these, at these states, compute eigenvectors and eigenvalues, compute waves and speeds exactly as in the linear case, doesn't require a nonlinear root finder, and, and we do the update exactly as we did in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the non in the linear case. It's just that we now compute these row averages every single for every new time step, of course, these values are going to change. So um, we, we do have to recompute uh, there's nothing that's going to be sort of constant from one time step to the next. And, and row averages are available for oil. If you look into claw pack, you'll see that, that all the Riemann solvers are based on this idea. If you look at the Euler equations, it's going to be based on the idea of using row averages. Um, and then there are other, other important physical systems. And in fact, there's a fair amount of effort into trying to find these things for other physical systems. I might mention that not everybody is a fan of row averages using row, a row, what's called a row solver or a row scheme. And it does have some issues with sort of preserving positivity and things like that. So there's also lots of other approximate Riemann solvers which attempt to somehow avoid this, this sort of root finding that you might have to do in solving the exact, the exact Riemann problem. Okay. So again, here's just what, it, what the code looks like in the nonlinear case. It's almost identical. I left out a few things up here that is exactly the same as in the previous case. But here we compute row averages. So now a U, um, a row average... Here we compute, here's the, av here the row average, the square root of, of um, GH is just the square root of gravity times times, here's the, I should have made this maybe H rho, but in fact H rho was the mean between the left and the right states, okay. Um, speeds are exactly as they were in the linear case. A1 and A2, remember, were slightly different. They're not exactly the same, but we do have to still compute alpha 1, alpha 2, and the waves are are again alpha 1 times I get the first eigenvector, alpha 2 times the second eigenvector. And uh, again, I left out a few loops here, but the fluctuations are computed in exactly the same way as they were in the linear case. So this makes it actually fairly simple to, um, to implement different schemes. I just, this is a point, when I first started learning about this, I was confused on, on this particular point. It was never pointed, it sort of made clear, so I thought I would give you the advantage of my confusion and explain this one point. So, so you know, we talk all about, like, say, solving a Riemann problem, but then at the same time, we also talk about, about shocks. So here's a shock that's propagating, and, and to be honest, I don't actually know if this is a true shock, but let's pretend it's a true shock, okay? This is a true <laughs> shock that's propagating. And, and here's what looks like, and I'll call this a smooth region of the flow. It looks like it's probably a rarefaction wave, but let's pretend it's just some smooth region of the flow, and here's a shock. And we say, but wait a second, at every, at every little tiny cell interface, I'm solving a Riemann problem. I, I'm, I'm looking for shocks and rarefactions, but, but there's no shock and rarefaction right in here. You know, isn't that kind of weird? What, what's the deal? What's, the, what's, what's kind of this this sort of you know, large-scale thing that we think of as a shock, and then this idea that at every cell interface we're solving for shocks and rarefactions. Well, the answer is that in most cases, it's true, if we were to exactly solve the Riemann problem at every cell interface, we would, get, we would satisfy either a shock condition or a rarefaction condition, and we would find one or the other, okay? Um, but in most cases, the jump between the left and the right states is on the order of the mesh spacing. So the shocks are really weak. They basically go to zero as the, as the mesh spacing increases. So it's true that, yeah, you might think in here there's going to be a tiny rarefaction or a tiny shock wave. They really are not going to show up in the, in the macroscopic picture. The only one that shows up is, say, this really big one, and only here is are the difference between the left and the right states going to be order one, okay? 
So let's just take a look at a picture, and I and the picture I have here is again is just scalar advection, but this just to kind of demonstrate so far so far what what scheme I've described, okay? And this is kind of a classic example. It it, it shows you know all the things sort of you've got a sharp peak, you've got a smooth hump, you've got a, a square wave, and 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 some of you for for a number. For, for a number of you, I'm guessing that you're, you're not surprised to see this, because really all I've described is a first-order method, right? So after this, this, this advection, the exact solution is here in blue. This red solution has now become extremely diffuse, and it looks like the sharper the peaks, the worse the, worse the diffusion. And in fact, uh, Patrick just talked about this exact phenomena. He pointed out that, that in fact, you know, the problem is that the truncation error of the scheme is proportional to the curvature. And so here we have a really high curvature, so the truncation error is really large, and that just gets cut off immediately. Um, here, who knows what's happening? The truncation error isn't even really, you know, it's not a smooth function. Um, here, things look a little bit better, only because it's sort of less curved, okay? And then here, again, we have this real sort of sharp hat function. Well, I just want to say a few things about this, and what, what do we do to uh, fix this, and some of you, again, we're, I've been talked so far about just a first-order scheme, which in more common vernacular is simply an upwind scheme, okay? It's first-order accurate, and we can see from the uh, modified PDE that, that the, the sort of the thing that we're really solving is this reaction diffu is this, uh, diffusion equation with a fairly a good-sized diffusion coefficient. In fact, it's proportional to the mesh spacing you know, sort of the, uh, mesh spacing is not, you know, sort of delta x squared or cubed. It's delta x. It's also, uh, interestingly, proportional to the Courant number. So if you were to manage to take a time step such that this number was exactly zero, you wouldn't see any diffusion. If you had to take a really time, really small time step for whatever reason, mm -hmm. you could, in fact, sort of uh, worsen your, your solution. So this is another reason why we try to always take time steps that are on the order of, of uh, that, that sort of a, a CFL number that's close to one. Well, so what we can do is try to be clever and say, well, why don't I just sort of build this extra term into, you know, it, just sort of discretize this piece here. And then maybe the trunk sort of push, kick the truncation error down the road a little bit. And in fact, that's exactly what uh, Lax and Wendroff uh, did, or, or, you know, this is one way to think about what they did. They simply discretized this, this term in the truncation error and, and uh, developed the lax wendroff method, okay? And if we rearrange terms a little bit, it looks maybe a little more familiar, but the lax wendroff term involves some sort of upwind term, mm -hmm. which is exactly our kind of upwind scheme, plus a, a sort of a correction term, okay? And the dispersion, of course, the, the, uh, the uh, truncation error for this is now on the order of h squared. And the errors are going to look very different because they're actually dispersive errors. And that leads to other issues. Um, we take a look. This is, in fact, we, this is exactly what we do to obtain higher order. Uh, here's a, the upwind term, which involve kind of those, those fluctuations. Now, we, um, these, of course, just are waves. They're simply differences. Differences. Uh, amongst, you know, in values but from one cell to the next and with some kind of, of coefficient out here. Um, you know, other methods tend to look at these, maybe look at these as slopes. This whole, you can sort of rewrite things a bit and, and think of these as, as being slopes that you're adding. And, and either way, we use the term wave or other schemes might kind of refer to slopes. Um, if we rewrite it in this kind of wave propagation viewpoint, then our, our scheme would, our second order scheme now looks like this with again the first kind of the first order correction terms here and now a set of second order correction terms which we call F and, and which take this particular form and it just simply happens to be that, that uh, you know, here's sort of this coefficient out in front which has this kind of current number like, you know, sort of term which looks like it involves a current number and, and, and our waves out here. And an interesting thing to note is that uh, this, whereas this term here may or may not be conservative, this is, this is a sort of a conservative kind of update, okay? Um, for systems, we have exactly the same thing. So, so uh, the systems case, we just sort of put a, a summation out here. We now have uh, 
one through, we have now M waves and M speeds, but, but essentially it has exactly the same form. What this means in, in terms of software is that once you've computed waves and speeds, the second order correction terms can be can be constructed um, can be constructed um, uh, sort of behind the scenes. The user doesn't have to worry about constructing these things. They simply get built depending on whether you wanted to specify the first order scheme or the second order scheme. So that's all done kind of behind the scenes. Um, yeah. So let's see how this one does. Um, now again, some of you are probably not going to be surprised to see that, well, it looks like we fixed the diffusion problem. And in fact, for our fairly smooth hump here, things look pretty good. You know, we're clearly not clipping the solution nearly as much as we were before. So we fixed that, uh, fix that problem. But we have sort of introduced a new, a new issue here. And this is another well-known phenomena in, the, in this whole business, is that we, uh, we introdu introduce these, these sort of unpleasant oscillations. And they're not only unpleasant, they can be fatal in situations where, where you simply don't want negative heights or you don't want negative concentrations. Okay, so these can really mess with codes. And so people figured out early on, we have to fix this. And, and the reason I can explain just sort of what happens in the second order case. So in the first order case, we're simply, in the first order case, I should mention that didn't happen. Uh, what we did is we just simply took our piecewise, lin piecewise constant reconstruction and we just evolved it. And, and, and if you look what happens, so we just kind of slid the whole thing over. Every single new value is going to be an average. It's going to be somewhere between, say, the old values. Okay? There's sort of a built-in notion that we can never exceed. No one cell can ex sort of exceed its previous value. Or, or we can't introduce new extrema. But look what happened, and in this, in this new case, we've sort of now decided we're going to advex slopes. So we've inc included this kind of linear term, and now we're just going to advex those. Well, what can happen in that case? Um, I, does this show up? So, so, we may have, so we started with sort of piecewise constant data. Say this is a piecewise constant here, piecewise constant here. We added a slope, and we advected the slope. Well, look what we've done. We've now increased the value in this cell, whereas this cell was perfectly happy. You know, if the advection, constant coefficient advection, there's nothing, the value in this cell should have not changed at all. But by simply advecting this slope from one cell to the next, a piece of it was sort of left behind, and we increased the average value in this cell. Okay? We also increased it over here, but we're not so worried because we were sort of expecting to do that anyway. That's stuff that advected into this cell. The bigger concern is we increased it here. And, and that, that's the thing that we want to try to fix. And what we do, or we simply use uh, what are, so we have sort of high resolution methods which use limiters. And I'll say just a min mod limiter is one of the classic limiters. Uh, what we do is we attempt to limit these slopes or limit the waves. So whereas a slope may have had this kind of funny, funny sort of, uh, uh, configuration up here, in the min-mod case, you can see that we've in some sense kind of regularized the slopes so that we can't, uh, so that we really can introduce these new extrema. I should say a lot of this all works very well in 1D and 2D. Some of these things don't all carry through, but, but um, limiters are, are in fact, um, yeah. Uh, uh, in claw pack, we, all these four limiters are available. They're simply switches that you can, that you can choose. I don't know. I can't remember that. Just, you know, limiter one is mid-mod, two is super B, three is what's called monotonized, centralized, centered, uh, centered limiter, and four is Van Leer. And these formulas probably look a bit, a bit weird. And, and um, you know, there's, again, uh, if, you, if you go into Randy's book, they, he explains a bit, but lots of other places will explain kind of the, the, in the theory behind developing limiters. Um, so, so that's what I'm going to say. I'll show you in a minute here just what they do. But before, I just wanted to kind of summarize. I think I'm actually going to be probably done a bit early here. Uh, <laughs> summarize um, uh, what, what we've talked about so far. So we have waves. We have fluctuations. We have um, uh, upwind method. 
Okay, so here's our, here's our sort of standard upwind method. We have a lax wendroff method, which is the upwind method plus some correction terms. And then we have a high resolution method, which um, is really the lax wendroff method corrected mm -hmm. where, where we've now limited the <laughs> waves. Okay, so and how does that how does that how does that happen? Well, here was the correction term for just the standard lax wendroff method, and here is the here is the um, the correction term for the high resolution case. All right, so uh, so in which case, what do we do? Well, we simply just multiply the wave by this kind of limited, this sort of, um, yeah, let's see here. So in this case, for min-mod, we, we compute this value here. We look at, you sort of look at your values to the left. These, could, these are viewed as waves in the wave propagation approach. So we compare, we basically look at the ratio of waves and then evaluate this min-mod function. Um, and so this phi of theta is what we use, is what actually multiplies the waves, okay? So phi shows up down here, and this is, and this is kind, of, kind of how all that happens. And again, this sort of all happens behind the scenes. Okay, so these high-resolution methods are useful. Uh, wave limiters reduce oscillations near discontinuities, um, but they preserve second-order accuracy in smooth regions. The methods are not formally second order accurate, but we considered high resolution. So if you actually did a convergence study on one of these, on, on a high resolution method, you would find that it's, you know, order 1.8, 1.7. And the thing to always kind of remember is that if you are doing a conversion study and you're not seeing second order, you know, you sort of want to make sure you haven't left the limiters on because they will, they will sort of formally degrade the accuracy or the, 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 the convergence but in fact can often improve the accuracy, okay? So the magnitude of the error can often be improved. Um, they're useful even for linear problems, such as advection. So this is something that you kind of hear a lot. Oh, we're just doing scalar advection. Why do we need to use limiters? Why do we need to use Riemann solvers? Why do we need to use any of this? And you can take, it's not hard to generate, a, especially if you're advecting things that are not smooth, to generate a problem that will develop lots of ringing, okay? And, um, so even for, in fact, the example that I gave you was linear, and you saw the effects of the effects of, of uh, the oscillations that, that can arise in the second order scheme. So even for a linear problem, it's kind of our philosophy that 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 you definitely it's definitely worth the effort to use these kind of high resolution schemes. Uh, Clawpack has several limiters available, and um, I guess I'll point out that the limiters really only affect the second order correction terms. First order methods simply just don't use the limiters. There's, there's nothing to limit, okay? Uh, so let's take a look at the example here. So here we have now the, uh, the, the case with limiters. And you see that it's, it's you know, certainly a lot better, if, if not almost perfect. I mean, what really, you know, and for a numerical scheme, to get, it's almost perfectly getting the smooth hump. Let me see if I can make this stop here when I want. I know, I gotta be fast, okay. I, I usually put a second slide in that has the, okay, okay, wait for it, wait for it. There we go, okay. So that's the fine, that, that's sort of, well, it had gone around several times at this point. But you can see that, that this one here is nearly perfect. I mean, there's a slight, maybe a slight kind of something going on here. This one here, for this is an actual hat, just a peak hat function, almost perfect. Again, you know, you're sort of clipping the high, the high, the really sharp peaks, but, but it's doing much better than certainly the first order and, and a lot. And we don't have those ugly oscillations that the second order scheme had. Um, the square wave is, 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 looks good. It's, you know, slightly smeared out, but it actually still looks pretty good. And even this kind of sharp peaked Gaussian is looking pretty good. Um, so, you know, and things like, and I guess maybe tomorrow in a, was where, I, you know, the way we would sort of argue to fix this kind of problem here, you could throw more resolution at it, or you could sort of adaptively refine if you're really interested in resolving those peaks on a fine scale. Okay. So, in fact, that's what I was going to talk about today. I thought I might, I was, at one point I was going to get into well balancing, but really decided that maybe, maybe 
tomorrow I'll, I'll be able to say a few things about that because it really ties in well with the way our approach to solving Riemann problems. And then there's a the whole issue of what do we do in two dimensions, which I'll be able to keep kind of short. And then, of course, I want to say a few things about adaptive mesh refinement, which is, um, which is of course, what GeoClaw is all based on this idea of Cartesian, uh, Cartesian um, block structure adaptive mesh refinement. So I think, I think I'm done. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer questions. And uh, otherwise, we're going to go for coffee break. Nothing? Yes? I wonder if there are any known uh, pitfalls or prices to pay with a particular selection of a linear. Um, how, do you, how do you, obviously, there must be some guiding principle that might go qualitative. Um, there are people that worry about that. I'm not one of them. I tend to like the MC limiter a lot. We tend to all kind of just pick one and use it. Um, so I probably, that's, I don't have a great answer for you. I think there, I know of examples of a few people who will argue that their limiter is particularly good for certain kinds of problems, but I don't know a lot. What about cost? It's not that expensive. It's actually fairly cheap. Applying a limiter is not expensive at all. And again, this is all stuff that's done very locally because you're sitting in a way you look at you look at the ratio between the value of your wave and the wave next to it, and, of course, and then and then you simply um, you know you looked at that mid mod function, and this is so it's all local expense in any case. Yeah, so it's fairly inexpensive. <laughs>